Alrighty, well, we will go ahead and get started here. Um, appreciate everyone for joining us today. Um, we are going to be talking all things uh, Proposition 1 uh, today as it relates to the implementation timeline and um, and everything to be had with uh, the implementation of Prop 1. And we've got a great group of folks from the state here with us today to answer your questions, be a resource and, and share all their uh, their knowledge and everything they have to to offer for us about uh, Proposition 1. And um, maybe Lauren, can we go to the next slide? So we've got a great group of folks um, here from Health and Human Services Agency, uh, Veterans Affairs, uh, uh, Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, as well as HCD. So well, a wide ranging topic, Prop 1, and obviously a, a, a great group of uh, diverse panelists here to, to speak to you about this. Um, and just want to remind folks before we get started, please throw your questions into the Q&A. We're going to have uh, the state will will be providing an overview and, and more details about Proposition 1 and all the components of it. And then we'll have time at the end for some for some Q&A. So please be sure to uh, add your, your questions to the Q&A and, um, and we'll try our best to get to them. Anticipating we'll get a lot of questions, but try our best to get to all of them. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to our, our uh, folks over at the state of California here to walk us through Prop 1 and share all their info that they have with us. Thanks, Chris. I think all the state team members will come on camera and um, we'll pull up our slides at the same time and just do quick introductions. I'm Sasha Kurgan. I'm the Deputy Secretary of Housing at the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, or BCSH. And I'm joined by many other state team members, Corinne. Hi folks, Karim Buchanan here. I serve as a Deputy Secretary for Policy and Strategic Planning with California's Health and Human Services Agency. Really thrilled to be here with you all today. I will pass it to Carrie. Hi, my name is Carrie Scott. I'm the Assistant Deputy Director at the Department of Housing and Community Development, and I'll pass it over to Sean. Well, hello there, Sean Johnson. I, I can't seem to get my video to turn on, but uh, I am uh, Assistant Deputy Secretary in the Veteran Services Division at CalVet, and uh, the areas I work uh, with is uh, the county offices, district uh, district offices, county veteran services office, and uh, housing and homelessness program. So uh, happy to join the panel today and looking forward to the conversation. Awesome, Lauren. We can go to the next slide. So hi folks, you've got Corinne here again. We wanna give a big shout out and thank you to Housing California for having us here today. We're really excited to tell you a little about where we stand with Proposition 1. I know that you all have been watching very closely and many of you actively involved. Um, and we are excited to give you an update on where we are as we move forward with implementation. Many of the folks represented here on the call and who are joining have been uh, working, working their buns off to make this happen. And it's very exciting to see all of the folks from housing providers up and down the state who are here to learn more. We're so thrilled you joined us today. So what we are hoping to talk about today um, is just a little bit about why this connection that is so inherent to Prop 1 between housing and health and what it means. Um, we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty on what is the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program and what HomeKeep uh, Plus is going to look like. We'll spend some time diving deeply into the Behavioral Health Services Act, which is the other part of Prop 1, um, and how the changes to the BHSA will help us advance our work to provide housing across the state. We've got a section that's designed just for you about what housers need to know and especially focused on how you can get involved um, in the ongoing implementation activities, both at the state level and the local level. And then we've put together a, a compendium of what we think are the most important resources for you all to have um, as we move forward in implementation. Um, so with that, we can move to the next slide. All right. So I want to take a moment and a step back just to talk about the work we're doing uh, in California in this administration to support mental health for all. Um, California is transforming our entire mental health and substance use disorder system with a focus on trying to create better behavioral health care 
for all Californians. So the work under Prop 1 is not happening in a vacuum. We also have really significant efforts underway to um, transform how our Medi-Cal system works and how we deliver behavioral health services through Medicaid in California. We're also doing a lot of really important work on behavioral health parity, including for people who are uh, commercially insured, so not just our Medi-Cal population, but all Californians across the state to ensure that, that we can all access behavioral health services where we want it, when we want it, um, uh, up and down the state. So we're excited to be you know, advancing this work across multiple fronts, including Prop 1. Next slide, please. And I thought I would just take a moment to also share what our commitment to Californian, Californians really looks like um, and what we mean by mental health for all. And what we mean is more mental health care and substance use treatment for all. So improving um, access to care and uh, the, the volume of resources that we have at our fingertips here in California. Making nation leading behavioral health investments. And that includes expanding services. That includes creating new facilities, which I'll talk to you about later today. Very importantly for this group, that means investing in housing. Um, and we believe um, that uh, housing is really important to overall health, uh, behavioral health outcomes for Californians. I will say, I think if you ask any clinician who's working with people experiencing um, homelessness who have a behavioral health condition, and some of you might even be on the call today, um, it is very likely that housing would be among the top needs of your clients, if not the top need of your client to help support their path to recovery. So um, I think you all know it, I'm preaching to the choir, but housing is a really important um, piece of this puzzle. And then lastly, workforce. So very important um, and historic investments in our workforce in California um, to create more opportunities for clinicians um, at all levels up and down the state. We have a real focus on accountability for results. Um, and a part of that is baked into Proposition 1. And I'll talk a little bit about it when we talk about the Behavioral Health Services Act. Um, which for the first time ever requires an integrated plan in how counties are delivering behavioral health services and very clear metrics to help us really drive towards success. Um, this work is also about partnerships, and that's part of why we're here today, um, about building partnerships at the city and county level, the public and private level, um, working with uh, housing developers in included in that, um, thinking about how we partner more effectively with the locals at the state level, and how we engage stakeholders and people with lived expertise and how we are designing and implementing programs. And then lastly, I'll share our commitment to acting quickly. Um, and by that, we mean now. <laughs> um, and we've got a lot of work underway um, right now that can help us to do this work. And one example of that is the Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Program or model, which is administered by the Department of Healthcare Services as an, and to date has provided over a billion dollars in resources uh, to hit, hitting the ground now to be able to provide housing resources for people who have behavioral health conditions and a diverse set of resources, including rental subsidies, interim housing, and other models. Um, the uh, other thing I'll lift up now is that while we're waiting for the implementation of the um, Behavioral Health Services Act, the Mental Health Services Act, our existing funding, um, can be put to, it is and can be um, expanded in its use to support housing resources today. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we move along. Next slide, please. And at this moment, I will pass it over to Sasha. Thanks, Corinne. Uh, so building on what Corinne was just sharing about the importance of acting now, I just want to hearken to what we do in our statewide housing plan. And one of three goals is to continue to act with urgency to address homelessness and housing need. And that is certainly represented in our work on Proposition 1, but that's not just work that's happening at housing and community development alone or at BCSH alone. That's an all of government approach. And so wanted to just touch deeply or quickly on why you're gonna see so many different team members from the state today. And that's because interagency coordination is a main part of the way that we're gonna get this done. Uh, this is not just about HHS or BCSH or how many times you're going to want to throw me and the rest of us in acronym jail for all the acronyms that we're going to mention today. But there's a bunch of state teams showing up in this work because it's an important component of implementation on Prop 1. Um, it's really critical that we work closely together. And the good news is that this is not the first time that we've been working together. So we're bringing some of the best practices that we have from programs that many of you have accessed, but in a new framework within Proposition 1. 
Um, but we're also here not just because the statute calls us in different places, but because when we talk about aligning housing, health, and supporting veterans, there's shared work and sometimes translation needed to do the work successfully. So I really just wanna thank Housing California for hosting all of us today, because we'd like this to be the start of a conversation where our interagency state teams come in here, uh, not only share information, but hear from you all about questions and acknowledge that even if we don't have a question that can be answered today, we will continue to make ourselves available so that we can work with all of you knowing that your success in Prop 1 um, is really critical and we're here to support that. Um, so to do this work in Proposition 1, both the Health and Human Services Agency and the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency from our secretaries on down are working to support implementation. And that's going to look like work that we're going to do this year constantly and in the longer term. So this year, our agencies are supporting the Department of Healthcare Services, Housing and Community Development, and CalVet to provide and release the capital investments from the bond for treatment settings on the DHCS side and permanent housing on the HCD and CalVet side. Our constant work looks like the secretaries from both HHS and BCSH providing a steady co-chairing role within the California Interagency um, the, sorry, the Cal ICH, the California Interagency Council on Homelessness. And that's where a lot of our work on coordinating the whole state system in our response to homelessness will exist longer term. And you heard Corinne uh, give the lead in for this. We want to support the implementation of the ongoing BHSA resource. So this is the transition from the Mental Health Stabilization Act to the Behavioral Health Stabilization Act and making sure that we realize the investments that are carved out in the statute for housing and services there. To do this, we know we need a really robust spectrum of housing solutions to address the housing shortage. And that's gonna take concurrent and work and investments along many of the things that Prop 1 facilitates. Um, last, I just wanna reiterate what Corinne shared that we can acknowledge that housing is deeply related to health. And without stable housing, we know that folks won't have good health outcomes. And so that's really the reason why we're doing this work. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Corinne who's gonna walk us through more of the HHS side. Thank you, Sasha. Beautifully said. I um, appreciate the focus on interagency coordination, which is a big part of how this work is being rolled out, and also what we hope it looks like at the local level. And I think you all will be very key to making that happen. And I also just want to say thank you so much for people who are introducing themselves in the chat. I'm having a really fun time seeing lots of um, familiar names. So thanks for doing that. All right, so we're going to start off by talking a little bit about um, the, the infrastructure funding, the bond part of Prop 1. Um, and by that, we mean the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program. We call it BCHIP and Home Key Plus. Um, so let's go ahead to the next slide. And I should say that both elements of this bond are a very interconnected parts of how we address the housing needs of people experiencing homelessness um, and people with behavioral health conditions up and down the state. All right, so here's the details on um, the beat chip. So AB 531, which is a part of Prop 1, created the Behavioral Health Infrastructure Bond Act, which provides $6.3 billion um, in bond funding. And of that, $4.4 billion is for competitive grants for cities, counties, and tribal entities, nonprofit, and private sector towards creating behavioral health treatment settings. So you could think of this as like the home key for treatment settings. Um, and the remaining $2.2 billion is specifically for supportive housing. Um, of that $4.4 billion for the behavioral health treatment settings, $1.5 billion will be awarded through competitive grants that are only for county, cities, and tribal entities. And of that portion, $30 million is set aside for tribes only. Uh, DHCS competitive grant requirements are going to be similar to um, the previous iterations of the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program or BCHIP. Um, so again, like Home Key, we've had uh, we've done we've been at this work for some time, and this is just the latest iteration um, of a, a really successful model to date. There will be some additional requirements um, that are outlined in the request for applications, which I'll um, tell you a little about in a moment. Next slide. All right, um, so here I wanted to just give you a sense of what this is looking like at the state level. 
Um, you all are housers, um, but I will say that many of these treatment settings that are uh, we are breaking ground on or cutting ribbons on today are going to be a really important part of how the people and your you know, your tenants and others um, will be able to expand their access to the kinds of inpatient and outpatient treatment settings that will support their long term uh, needs and their housing stability. So. Um, uh, again, we've been quite active. Um, this map represents 130 behavioral health treatment projects in 38 counties that have received state funding already in the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Project. So these are the, again, the precursor to the bond funded uh, uh, resources. Next slide, please. Just to give you a sense of what we've been able to accomplish to date in these previous rounds of what we call BCHIP, we've created um, just over 2,600 inpatient and residential beds through our rounds one through three, which were focused on those settings. And over 280,000 inpatient slots we've been able to create up and down the state through uh, similarly through these rounds three through five. Um, we are very excited about what we've been able to accomplish and can't wait um, to see what we can do with the additional resources provided through the bond. Next slide. Just to give you a little detail on where we're at, in May of this year, we released um, information about uh, what will be available in these resources through round one, um, which is 1.8 billion open to county, cities, tribal entities, as well as nonprofit and for-profit organizations. Um, and a second round, which will be specifically open to cities, counties, and tribal entities of 1.5 billion. Um, and I'm happy to share that in July, we were able to post our request for applications. So that is sort of our version of ANOFA um, and shared a link to you. I know many of you may not be developers of treatment settings, but if you know people who are, if you've got colleagues in this space, we hope you'll make sure that they're aware of this really important request for applications that has been posted. And our plan is to make these um, awards by early 2025. So moving very quickly to get these resources out the door and to get these settings stood up to serve Californians in need. There will be a final round of these resources um, up to 1.1 billion that will be available in mid 2025. Um, so that's the, that'll, that'll be, that'll close us out in terms of the resources made available for treatment settings. All right, next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to my colleagues to talk a little bit more about the supportive housing side of the shop. Thanks, Corinne. So building on what Corinne shared, I think many of you on the call know about the Home Key program. Um, just since 2020, there have been more than 250 projects all around the state. Um, we're not going to talk as much about um, the earlier rounds of Home Key, but just really I want to pivot us to think about how we build from and how we learn from what's been working in Home Key and also what we've learned in early rounds of VHEP, the, the Veteran Health and Housing uh, Prevention Program, um, and thinking about how we're taking the best from Home Key and the best from VHIP to build that into Home Key Plus. So as I'm going to introduce, reintroduce um, colleagues from HCD and from CalVet, um, and ask, ask Carrie Scott first to, to present a little bit about Home Key. Um, but as you can see here, going from that 6.3 billion that Corinne was talking about, 1.972 billion will go to HCD um, and in partnership with CalVet for supportive housing. Um, this is all gonna be permanent housing um, and it's branded under Home Key Plus. Uh, 1.065 billion for veterans and 922 million uh, for general pool. So Carrie is going to walk us through uh, some initial elements of the program's design. Thank you, Sasha. And yeah, great segue into the Home Key Plus program. So these investments are modeled after the Home Key program and its successful model of getting units built quickly and efficiently to house Californians at risk of or experiencing homelessness. To date, the Home Key program has funded over 250 projects, resulting in over 15,000 awarded units. And there's an estimated number of California households to be served over the lifetime of these projects at 167,000 over that number. 
So the Home Key program has become a significant part of the state's homelessness, homelessness response efforts, and Prop 1 will build on those successes. The tenant population for Home Key Plus will be targeted at extremely low income and experiencing or at risk of homelessness, with over half of the funds to be used for veterans. Veterans, of course, will be discussed in more detail, but includes active military, naval, or air service who were discharged or released under conditions other than dishonorable. What's new to this program is the behavioral health challenge component, and that includes but is not limited to serious mental illness or substance use disorder. And while the existing Home Key program did provide seed money for supportive services, it also required applicants to provide a long-term plan and sustainability of those services. Prop 1 will be similar in the design. We will be asking Prop 1 applicants to begin as soon as possible to think about what the long-term sustainability of those supportive service operation costs will be. One of the great successes of the Home Key Home Key program is due to its flexibility, allowing jurisdictions to pursue a variety of strategies depending on the local need. Uh, so eligible uses of these funds include master leasing of properties for non-congregate housing, conversion of units from non-residential to residential, new construction of dwelling units. So this can be stick belt, stick belt, it can be modular units. The purchase of affordability covenants and restrictions for units, relocation costs for individuals who are being displaced as a result of the rehabbing of these units, and capitalized operating subsidies. Eligible entities continue to be cities, counties, and regional and local public entities, but we do have the flexibility now to allow development sponsors um, with loans from these funds. And next slide, please. All right, so here is the high level timeline for the Home Key Plus program. What is happening right now is we have already started engaging with our stakeholders, including a demand survey, which was sent out in late June. And that helped uh, HCD to identify potential projects, the types of those projects, the total development costs, estimated number of units, and operating match sources, and that's just to name a few. This was helpful for HCD to understand the demand of these funds, and that will help us to inform our program design where possible. So we also asked about interest in filling funding gaps in projects that are shovel ready. We have also released a Home Key Plus fact sheet onto our HCD Home Key Plus webpage, and uh, please take a look at that if you haven't already. Additionally, this summer, HCD plans to release a program summary, and this will include much more detail on what to expect in the NOFA. Speaking of the NOFA, it will be released in late uh, 2024, with the applications will be over the counter and they'll be accepted in early 2025, and awards will begin as early as summer of 2025. And next slide, please. I just want to end my portion with this slide. It's a successful uh, home key project of countless successful projects that we've had. This is LM Village. It's in the city of Healdsburg. And this is what you think of when you think of a typical home key project. It's a motel conversion. It has on and off site on and off site services. It's uh, got a great location within one mile of grocery store, pharmacy and transit. So this is a great option for your Home Key Plus funds, but don't limit yourself either. We encourage you to be thoughtful and open-minded in what kinds, what kinds of projects you'd like to pursue that will meet your needs. With that said, I will pass it over to my colleague, Sean at uh, CalVet. Awesome, thank you, Carrie. I'm going to build a little bit on uh, on what Carrie said. She mentioned uh, some of the work that has been going on between HCD and Calvet in, in terms of uh, building the design for Home Key Plus. Just uh, want to touch a little bit on sort of the dollars, the intended uh, uh, veterans to serve, a little bit about vet veterans in California, um, a little bit of a history and uh, and sort of some um, some some what some of what we've learned with the uh, Veterans Housing and Homelessness Prevention Program, the VHIP program. 
Um, and then also an example of, of, a, of the type of a project that we find to be successful as far as the output of the VHHP or VHIP program. So um, as you've heard, uh, a little over a billion dollars worth of, of investments that are aimed at serving veterans at uh, experiencing homelessness at risk of homelessness um, uh, with a special emphasis on those veterans experiencing chronic homelessness, um, especially those with uh, mental health needs or experiencing um, varying degrees of substance use disorder. Um, a little bit about veterans in California. Some of you may not um, be aware of uh, of how prominent veterans are in California, but there's over a million, there's roughly a million and a half veterans living and residing in California. Um, we have, uh, and that's among the tops uh, in terms of states in the nation. Um, but with the size of the of our population, we also have a large population of veterans experiencing homelessness. Um, around 10,000 is what the last uh, data has indicated, the last uh, point, in time, point in time count. Um, but I wanna make sure that we, that we recognize that this is a number that has come down significantly. Uh, the state has, has in, uh, deployed uh, the Veterans Housing and Homelessness Prevention Program starting in 2014. Um, so, but really kind of looking at the degree of homelessness, you know, in the last decade or so, um, you know, back in 2010, 29, 2010 timeframe, we were looking at, you know, an upwards of 18,000 veterans experiencing homelessness. Uh, and today, it, it, you know, latest data that we have available to us suggests that we're right around 10,000, right? So we've made significant strides, but 10,000, I don't know if that number sounds good to you, but 10,000 to me sounds like we still have a lot more work to do. And thankfully we have this, uh, this program in, in order to do so. Um, and so, uh, you know, as Carrie mentioned and has been mentioned in the uh, in the presentation so far, uh, CalVet and HCD has been hard at work developing this the bond side of this program. Um, and you know, it's it involves these the, this uh, you know um, specialized veteran population. I want to emphasize that this is a specialized population with specialized needs in terms of uh, in in terms of working with veterans in order to make sure that they're stably housed make sure that they're in a successful position to thrive in their community. Um, so they need, uh, you know, there needs to be special in, uh, a consideration of supportive services, which include, you know, a variety of health, mental health, substance use disorder treatment. Um, it also includes other, you know, sort of uh, supplementary services like legal aid you see here. Um, we, we want to make sure that all sites that are serving veterans um, have some level of expertise in veteran cultural competency, a, a, an incredibly important part of serving veterans as that specialized population. It's, it takes specialized understanding of the culture surrounding uh, military and veteran life to understand truly how to build that kind of trust in order to successfully keep sta uh, keep veterans stably housed. Um, and so we really, we really focus, uh, you know, our, in, our intention and as well as, you know, what we sort of focused our intention on with the VHIP program to really sort of focus on that, um, those hardest to serve veterans, the ones who who are experiencing mental health challenges and significant substance use disorder um, situations. So, um, you know, we we also want to, and as you see here, the disability pension claims. Many uh, veterans who fall into this category um, stand to, uh, you know, could stand to benefit from ben uh, claims representation, seeing them through the process of establishing and finalizing claims. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're getting those kinds of efforts interlaced within the supported services plan, um, in addition to the type of supported services I've mentioned, and in addition to the cultural aspect that it is so critical. Um, and so uh, this is some of the things that we that we strive to incorporate is to really sort of nail down the kind of supported services that pair up with the 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 um, the development dollars here to really turn uh, you know situations around for veterans. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So the, the Veterans Housing Homelessness Prevention Program, VHIP, um, was a, another effort. And, you know, and this is the Home Key Plus, is, as you've you know, heard, the second uh, big collaboration between CalVet and HCD. Um, so we have a lot of experience working together. We, we complement each other's uh, strengths very well. Um, we really uh, uh, have done a lot of good work and have and has a lot of veterans. You can see here in the numbers. I'll get to those. 
Um, $600 million was redirected from the, uh, the farm and home uh, CalVet budget uh, in order to uh, fund the VHIP program um, by way of Prop 41 in 2014. Um, and it really is a was an innovative program because it uh, start it it essentially paired the idea of building support permanent supportive housing that is central to Home Key Plus, plus also incorporating affordable housing that is uh, available to uh, veterans at any you know sort of range of income levels. Um, and so we found that to be uh, incredibly successful. We we uh, partnered with HCD CalVet and CalHFA in order to bring that to fruition. Um, and we've had eight funding rounds in that program. Uh, 99 projects awarded, uh, you know, um, 60 of them are actually operating at this moment, um, and the rest are uh, on their way to becoming operating projects. Uh, over six and a half, uh, 6,500 total units uh, that have come from those investments, um, 3,300 plus are specifically uh, reserved for veterans and their families. Um, you know, and once, uh, once all of the projects are, uh, once we see all of these projects come to fruition. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, I want to highlight uh, Edwin M. Lee. This is a an example of a new construction project that came with a you know a VHHP award, the HIP award. Um, it, as you can see, uh, depicted by the uh, by the the details here, uh, it is a uh, sort of permanent supportive housing site. It also in incorporates income restricted uh, general affordable units. Um, for a total of 118 occupiable units um, uh, for veterans. Um, this is uh, a, a new construction uh, site in the heart of the Mission Bay uh, area in San Francisco. Um, and we're really, and, and this is kind of a, an example of the type of things we are really excited about because um, Chinatown Community De Development Corporation was the developer sponsor on this project. And they worked uh, very closely with the lead services provider, who is Swords to Plowshares, also based in the Bay Area, San Francisco. Um, and so this is an example of two uh, significant community-based organizations coming together through a program. And, you know, we've talked about partnerships. You've heard a little bit about that as we've talked through this. But we're partnering at the state level and we're seeing community uh, partnerships such as this that develop these kinds of properties that serve, uh, you know, that serve the population really well. Um, you know, 118 uh, veterans who are now housed because of it. But this uh, this kind of uh, uh, project really gets at the heart of how we serve veterans and how we, um, you know, and how we engage with them, bringing together the, the all the tenants and resources of, of, of the health uh, space with the, all the resources that we have available in the housing space. So we're excited about this and kind of hoping to see a lot more of this, uh, you know, as as we unroll um, Home Key Plus. That's all I have on uh, on on that. So I'll I'll toss it back over. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sean. All right. So what we're hoping to do now is just do a little dive into the Behavioral Health Services Act. There were a couple of questions in the chat about like what about ongoing resources, um, and so happy to share uh, what we're doing under the Behavioral Health Services Act which is a reform to the Mental Health Services Act, which was created in about 20 years ago um, and hasn't had, never had had a significant reform since that time. And as I'm sure you all are tracking, a lot has changed in the last 20 years, namely um, the passage of the Affordable Care Act and the expansion of Medi-Cal here in California, which really changed the landscape of how we're funding um, behavioral health services um, in, in our state and create an opportunity for us to really um, better leverage these um, flexible, what's often known as the millionaire's tax here in California, um, to be able to make the greatest impact. So next slide, please. I want to just share a bit in terms of the legislative findings um, and the why we're up to this big um, reform of the MHSA, or millionaire's tax. And that is that over 1.2 million adults in California are living with serious mental illness, and one in three, 13 children has a serious emotional disturbance. The need is great. 82% of Californians experiencing homelessness reported having a serious mental health condition, and one in 10 Californians meet the criteria for substance use disorder. And what is widely known as our shortage in behavioral health facilities, which contribute to the growing crisis of homelessness and incarceration among those with a mental health disorder. Um, and a belief that if we can invest in um, integrated and community-based settings, we can really change the arc of someone's life and connect them on a path to um, recovery. 
So um, the only other um, thing I'll also say, um, because we're a bunch of housers here, is that we also know that it's uh, the lack of affordable housing that's driving the crisis of both homelessness and um, certainly exacerbating the mental health needs of those who are homeless or housing insecure in our state. Um, so a big part of why we're here and doing this work. Next slide. All right. Um, so uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the structural reforms that we're making to the BHSA under Prop 1 that have been made. Um, is And to set the stage, I think folks may know that in California, the way in which our behavioral health system is funded is a pretty complex mix of both insurance, that's Medi-Cal and private insurance, um, county funding, and um, this MHSA or BHSA fund. So we have a pretty diverse set of um, resources that are flowing into our system. And this BHSA reform, as I said, is the, the first major structural reform since 2004. And it is designed to expand and increase the types of supports that are available to Californians by focusing in on a few really key gaps and priorities. Um, and so to name those, the first is a focus very explicitly on the most vulnerable and the highest risk, um, including set-asides for children and youth. Um, broadening the target population of who can be served. So uh, for the first time ever, we can serve people who have a substance use disorder. Um, so that's why we renamed it from the Mental Health Services Act to the Behavioral Health Services Act, behavioral health being a term that encompasses both mental health and substance use disorders. It updates allocations um, for local services into state directed funding categories, including housing supports. And I'll walk you through those in just a minute. And it also clearly advances community defined practices as a key strategy for reducing health disparities and increasing community representation, especially in local decision making. It also revises the county process for planning and reporting on behavioral health outcomes, and it improved tra transparency and accountability for system and our systems performance in improving the health um, and well being of our residents. Next slide please. I wanna just talk to you about a few key opportunities as well. Um, we have already talked about um, the focus on uh, reaching and serving high need, high risk priority populations. Again, that includes children and youth um, with a focus on people who are chronically homeless or experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. Um, very, very important part of what we're trying to accomplish under these uh, the BHSA. Number two, again, the inclusion of the substance use disorder. Um, th three, a focus on housing as health. As we've said before, we believe that housing in this is an essential component of behavioral health treatment, recovery, and stability. Supporting children and youth um, who have serious mental illness and behavioral health needs with a focus on intervening early in the life course to prevent mental health conditions um, or reduce the possibility of those disorders uh, presenting in the first place and measuring our progress and impact. So we will, for the first time ever, require counties to submit what are called integrated plans. So we're looking at how their youth, how counties are um, investing and prioritizing all of their behavioral health resources at the local level, um, with the focus again on um, a transparently provided public reports um, that focus on outcomes for these um, investments. Next slide. All right, so now I'm gonna dive into one of the really important parts of the BHSA, which is an updated um, allocation of how funding is to be used at the local level. Um, so I will say, while there's still is some flexibility in the process, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, this is uh, sets a new, a new approach to how these resources can be best leveraged at the local level. So 90% of total um, BHSA funds flow to county departments of um, mental health or behavioral health. And there are now three updated categories of how these resources can be spent. Um, the first one I'll talk through is housing interventions, and that's 30%. 35% will go to full service partnerships, and I'll describe what that is, with the remaining 35% for behavioral health services and supports, um, including outreach and engagement as a part of this model, and um, notably uh, a requirement that 51% of these resources have to be used for early intervention. And of those resources, 51% must be used to serve individuals who are 25 or younger. Next slide. 
So there is some flexibility at the local level, as I mentioned. Um, counties have uh, flexibility within the funding areas to move up from 7% from uh, one category to another for a maximum of 14% that could be added to any one category. And this allows counties who we know are, are all look a little different to be able to address their local needs and priorities based on data and very importantly, community input. Um, I wanted to lift up that word community input because you all are parts of your communities um, in the counties where you're doing your work. Um, and uh, there'll be a moment where I'm gonna give you a bit of a call to action to um, tell you how to get involved in some of these decisions that are being made at the local level. Um, changes to how the resources are used are subject to DHCS, Department of Healthcare Services approval, and can only be made during the three-year plan cycle. Um, and right now, what communities are beginning to think about is their um, next cycle for 26 to 29. Um, and innovation opportunities are permitted in all categories. Next slide. All right, so let's get into the slide you probably are most interested in, which is the Behavioral Health Housing Interventions 30% Bucket. Um, and again, this is for children and families, youth, adults, and older adults living with serious mental illness or serious emotional disturbance and or substance use disorder who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Of those resources, 50% um, are prioritized for people who are chronically homeless with behavioral health challenges. The use of the funds um, is, I would say, fairly flexible um, and can include, um, and I think most importantly, rental subsidies. Operating subsidies can include shared and family housing. Um, uh, up to 25% can be used for capital development as well, um, as well as the non-federal share for certain transitional rent. Um, the resources are not limited to individuals who are a part of full service partnerships, and I'll talk about what that is in a minute. Um, uh, nor is it limited to people who are enrolled in Medi-Cal. And counties, like, as I said, have some flexibility. Um, small counties can request an exemption in the 26-29 period and ongoing if approved by DHCS. And what that means is basically they can demonstrate um, things such as um, a lack of need for these investments. And um, there is some flexibility for the remaining counties beginning in the 2032-35 planning cycle on the 30% requirement based on, again, certain DHCS criteria for exemptions. So a really important opportunity for, oh, let's go back for one more second. There's a really important opportunity um, to the tune of almost a billion dollars a year in ongoing resources to be able to meet the housing needs um, and to pay for the rent and the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the cost between uh, what it costs to operate housing and what our um, tenants can afford, a really important new resource, on, and namely ongoing resource. Okay, so someone gave that a heart and I'm very glad. <laughs> it's a pretty big deal. Um, next slide. Oh, here we go. This is where we were at. Thanks, um, Lauren. Okay, so full service partnerships is the other 35, is a 35% of these resources. And this is important for you all because these are the multidisciplinary, if field capable, really important teams that provide a behavioral health treatment and are likely to be serving many people experiencing homelessness um, uh, across the state. Um, the uh, teams can provide medication assisted treatment, which is uh, treatment for people who have opioid use disorder, can uh, provide community defined evidence practices. Um, they'll also be providing what's called assertive community treatment and forensic assertive community treatment, um, which is uh, an evidence based practice using, again, a field-capable team, multidisciplinary team-based models to deliver services to people with the most complex behavioral health conditions. Um, and we're really excited about um, moving more towards fidelity of these models in California. Um, we'll also be establishing standards of care with levels based on um, medical criteria. Uh, and these teams can also provide outpatient behavioral health services, either in a clinic or breaking down those four walls of the clinic and coming out to where people live, including um, in shelters on the street, et cetera. Um, and we'll say that ongoing engagement services are, are a, an important part of how full service partnerships do their job um, to maintain enrolled individuals and in their treatment plans, including clinical and those non-clinical services, um, including housing support services that are needed to help people maintain housing. Um, so a really important part of um, the delivery system. Next slide. 
And then lastly, resources can be used for a flexible bucket called behavioral health services for services and supports, which includes things like early intervention, outreach and engagement, um, workforce, capital facilities, IT projects, um, and other innovative projects. So, um, and again, a big chunk of this, as I said before, is for early intervention services with half of over half of that for um, young people in particular. Next slide. All right, I want to tell you a little about um, what to expect in terms of our timeline, and I'll use this as my opportunity to dive in also to how you can get engaged. Um, so these are our, some important milestones related to the BHSA in particular. We have started in um, a pretty significant way in engaging stakeholders, um, including public listening sessions uh, to help people get feedback and provide updates to our community about the policy creation that will be a part of the um, uh, Behavioral Health Services Act. Um, a great way to get involved in this is to email the DHCS email that's gonna be on the um, on a slide in a couple of moments. Um, you can email that email address and get added to the listserv, the Behavioral Health Services Prop 1 listserv, which we also refer to as Behavioral Health Transformation, um, to find out about when these events are happening and how you can stay engaged. Um, beginning in summer of 2024 is when we're beginning to make um, the bond money available. As you heard, um, we have released the RFA for BCHIP and the home key NOFA uh, will be following uh, thereafter. So I think you all know how to stay abreast of those uh, updates. And then importantly, um, beginning in early 2025, the Department of Healthcare Services will be responsible for beginning to um, release and engage in public comment related to the policy guidance that will guide how locals will be using these resources, including the housing interventions resources and the full service partnership resources, which are so key um, to housing stability for the people we hope to serve. Um, so would invite um, you all to also stay abreast of that process as well. And then um, very importantly, so that's sort of at the state level, how you might wanna stay engaged. And again, I think if you send send an email to the DHCS email, um, you'll learn how to, you can you can stay, stay, uh, stay abreast. And we've got some also some very cool um, new resources on our behavioral health transformation website, which I encourage you to check out the link. I'll put it in the chat and it's also on the slides. Um, we have a couple of really handy dandy fact sheets related to how MHSA funding can be used to support housing now and what to expect um, as we move to 30% housing interventions under BHSA. So um, if for folks who don't have it yet, we hope you take a look at some of those um, pretty useful, pretty digestible resources. All right, and then lastly, the behavioral health services integrated plans that are happening at the local level um, will go live in July of 2026. Um, so we've got a bit of time is what that means um, for you all to engage with your local partners at the county level um, to begin to plan for what this new transition will look like and how you might as a community um, make investments that will have the best um, and most deepest impact uh, in the lives of people experiencing homelessness in your community. So we'll definitely want to encourage you to, um, to get involved because we have heard that lots of planning is actually already underway in counties across the state to make this happen. So uh, with that call to action, I will uh, move on to the next slide. And I'm gonna pass it to Sasha. That's great, Corinne, thank you. Uh, we do have a good bit of call to action in this um, and that's what the next part of the presentation will be. But I just wanna kind of recap what we've covered already. Uh, we've talked about why this state team is working together. Uh, we've talked about the bond components of Prop 1 and how that can support capital investment in treatment and in housing set settings. And then Corinne, which she just shared, I think is so exciting and a lot of new information about the ongoing source of funds that it's in that's in BHSA and how housing and services funding shows up there. So that's huge. That's for existing and future housing. That's for all kinds of um, innovations and things that have already been working in MHSA. And so just wanted to recap that before we get to this section of the presentation, which is like Corinne was leading us into uh, to keep moving us into action and what can housing professionals and local governments do now and what do they need to know? So next slide, please. 
So as I mentioned um, earlier, you know, this is going to take uh, kind of an all team approach and also an all community approach, not just at the state level, but at the local level. Uh, some of what's on this slide is also on the home key plus fact sheet about what potentially interested folks of, who are going to apply to home key plus might be thinking about to get ready for the NOFA and the application. Um, so a few things there. Um, building on what Carrie shared, it's going to be really critical for housing professionals to develop relationships with local partners. And so, yes, like Home Key, uh, local public agencies are centered as eligible applicants. And so that already requires a partnership uh, between the local public agency and often housing developers and service coordinators and service professionals. Um, additionally, building on what Corinne shared, this relationship should be stretched a little bit to think about building relationships with county mental health or behavioral health departments um, as well as local continuum of care. Um, and for VETS projects, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and the great team at CalVET. Um, through all of this partnership, which I think is really the theme about how we prepare for Home Key Plus and for ongoing BHSA, is to think about how we not only identify and then obtain commitments of these more sustainable funding sources that includes existing MHSA, uh, we will share that link that Corinne mentioned about how MHSA can be used right now for housing and future BHSA funding. Um, the other is that the other thing that folks can do right now is to think about the needs or gaps within your community and to think about how to accomplish um, resolving some of those gaps with these funding sources, whether that's the capital investment, the ongoing source, or both, and thinking about how to braid that together. And with that, I think that really requires solid partnerships between housing and services teams. These are all things that many of you know. They're things that you're already doing in your portfolio. So this is not a new assignment. These may not even be new partnerships, but it's within a new framework and within some new authority um, that you might reinvigorate those existing partnerships. Next slide, please. So building on those actions that you can take right now, uh, we wanted to share a few more thoughts about ways that you can engage and prepare for all of this. Um, one is the resources that are currently available. We'll share those on the next slide and Housing California will have this deck and we'll also have all the resources that we, that we make available in the slide presentation. Um, aside from what we have right now, um, by way of resources, we are very interested in hearing what other technical assistance and resources could be useful. For those of you who have been working in HomeKey, uh, you know that we've done a few things to provide technical assistance as we went, not only in 2020, but ongoing, to think about how to make uh, more responsive technical assistance materials, knowing that we were trying to reach communities who maybe had never done projects like this before who maybe didn't know how to get it done. And so we want to keep doing more of that. And so please, aside from sending us questions, tell us your ideas about resources and technical assistance that may be useful. We will do our best uh, to think about things that we can deliver on and where we may need help, where we may need, may need help from others to deliver on some of those requests. But it's going to be most hopeful, helpful if we hear it. Um, Third, and this is an evergreen option, keep sending us your questions. I know just looking at time, we're not going to get all to all the questions that are in the chat today, but we will keep answering them. And we are happy to do more engagements like this to keep working through all the questions that come up. Um, after that, uh, after like what you're thinking about to do to prepare for Home Key Plus, please keep thinking about this upcoming guidance. So that is Home Key Home Key Plus's program overview, as Carrie and Sean mentioned, that's going to be released this summer, um, probably in September. Um, and then the Home Key Plus NOFA will be late 2024, right now targeted for November. Um, that will be the NOFA, and then the application would be released later. And then, as Corinne mentioned, there is a lot of opportunity and ways that I think I'm building on that translation theme, things that we need to think about as housing professionals about how we meet our health partners and they're creating these three as they're creating their three year integrated plans. That's going to require us understanding what the guidance is and then how to participate in the local plan. Next slide, please. 
So some of the resources that we mentioned today, and I think one more slide, uh, these are some of the things that we mentioned. We're happy to keep building on these. I know these aren't gonna be live links for those who are watching, uh, but we will share them. So the governor has a mental health for all webpage that is a good repository of a bunch of information. Uh, health and Human Services is thinking about how to transform the whole behavioral health system. It's a lot of what Corinne mentioned. Our partners who are implementing BCHIP have their webpage, um, HCD and HomeKey Plus, along with other existing webinars that we've done that are already posted. Um, so we will share those, but at this moment, I'm gonna turn it back to the Housing California team. Oh, sorry, next slide. Something else that's in the slide deck uh, is contact information. And so you can reach HHS and DHCS at the first email address, and then the BCSH, HCD, and CalVet team at the home key at hcd.ca.gov email address. Okay, now turning it over either to Chris or somebody from the Housing California team. Great, thank you all. I really wanna just appreciate all of you um, for, for sharing all of this with us. So much information. We've gotten a lot of engagement in the chat and in the Q&A and just wanna acknowledge that we have about 60 some questions in the Q&A, so we're not gonna be able to, to, to really get to the Q&A today. So what we'll do is um, we're gonna try and collect all of that Q&A since we're able to record this. Um, and share that with the folks at the state and try and get as many uh, answers as we can and get back to you all. Um, and you can also email me um, any other questions you may have, and I'll make sure it gets to the team. Obviously, uh, as Sasha mentioned, these are some great uh, emails for you to, to, to also send questions to. So my email, though, is just cmartin at housingca.org. Should be pretty easy for y'all. Um, and uh, we will certainly be sharing all of this the recording um, and the slides with you all in a follow-up. We're also planning to do more um, on Prop 1. Obviously, as you heard today, there's so much information, so much knowledge that we uh, are hoping to, to have our state folks share with you and, and um, a lot of questions to be answered and, and all of that fun stuff. So please um, be on the lookout for future uh, webinars we're planning to do probably in the fall, early next year as this timeline for gets further along for implementation of Proposition 1. So I uh, want to just, again, thank our panelists for being here today um, uh, and thank uh, you all for, for joining us. And um, uh, please do send your questions to us. And we will stop there. Thanks, y'all.